Whenever I get into like a hobby or a new game, am I the only one that just gets like hyper obsessed and like I'll be researching all kinds of videos and like getting into my the subculture of that. So like I start playing Magic the Gathering Commander with a few dads here in the neighborhood and now I can't just like start casually playing. I need to start obsessively watching everything with the best strategies, best tips, or I'll get into a new game. Like, you know, I've been playing Elder Scrolls Online recently and I'll just, you know, build best builds and all. It's yeah. It's a little weird sometimes, but if you're on YouTube and you're looking up home buying stuff, I'm assuming you're a little weird just like me. So I thought I would do something that I see a lot that I find very helpful when I do a new hobby or activity, like finding out the best practices to have a successful time playing that game, or in this case, buying your first home. The difference between a successful home purchase and one that wasn't so successful is you either have or you had a guide who has the experience and has bought multiple homes so they know what to look out for they know how things should be so if you don't have that guide yet allow these videos to be that so we're going to make three videos it's going to be a three parts today's video is going to be best practices to you for you before you start looking for a house second one is the best practice for you when you're looking for a house and last best practices when you're in a contract and after you've bought your first house. Maybe there's a fourth one after you bought your house. I don't know, it depends how this goes. So um, if you're watching this, please let me know, give me feedback. If you liked the, the video, if you didn't like it, if you want me just to get back to the single video stuff, that's cool. But all right, that intro has been too long now. So thanks for your patience and now let's get right to it. The first best practice that I have for you is stop trying to find the best timing for your home purchase. I get it. A lot of our parents, maybe grandparents or maybe close family members went through some terrible real estate like markets, like market just literally crashed like less than 10, 15 years ago. It's scary to think about the way freaking people just bought a house and they just lost all this value and how deeply it affected. Even even to this point, maybe your parents or, or maybe someone near you didn't really you know, suffer from that, but you hear the stories and you just can't help but worry and be scared about that. So I've had the pleasure of helping hundreds of families purchase their first home here in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And I like to come up with these little simple, like ways they describe things that help kind of just alleviate some tensions. And this simple three step warning signs is that something I created to kind of help me identify which local markets are like ones we should be buying in and which local markets are not ones. Now, remember what I just said, local market a lot of us like to obsess over the national real estate market or even like 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 even like looking at phoenix phoenix is such a massive city with a lot of people there's the amount of population um that our wonderful editor just looked up online hopefully it's correct uh, how many people we have living here we have different local markets that look are completely varied and and it just Try to do your best identifying data and stats from local specific markets, not just general region or even national. When I'm looking at local markets, I, there's three there's three easy identifying factors that I kind of narrow it down to. If a market is totally not safe for buyers, meaning there's a lot of sellers there, there's no way that there's any market or value being gained there, this is stay out of that market. And of course, does it make sense for some people to buy in a market like that? I mean, like, for example, I'm sorry, California. I, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand how expensive it is. I don't, I, I, <laughs> it's a red for me, unless you can really like sit down and explain to me why it makes sense to buy. It's a red for me. It's just too expensive. The price of living is too expensive and it just keeps going up and up and it's just scary to me, right? So if I'm going to a specific city and I start seeing, hey, Prices are very stagnant, houses being on the market for too long, there's no really equity being built, and it's just not seeming as a healthy market, it's a red. Yellow is, hey, only well-qualified buyers should be buying in this market. Um, meaning that, yeah, it's like not necessarily doing great, but it's not doing really bad and losing value as well. It's kind of just in the middle, and like right now, you really shouldn't be thinking about buying unless you're really well-qualified. And last but not least, like during pandemic days, do what you can to buy. You not, might not be in the best position to buy, but figure it out. Get down payment assistance, get some f borrowed funds from family members and just buy because this is a great opportunity. The problem with this system is it's kind of, it's really easy to identify looking back and it's hard to identify when you're currently in it. But for example, 2011 to 2018, it was a green market all the way. It was like, do what you can to buy. And a lot of people were doing down payment assistance. We can go back and we can chat about what markets were what, but anywho, kind of a just really simplify it. Like you're either one of these three markets and the words that really should stand out in this 
like whole page is well qualified. What a well qualified buyer to me means is you have four very strong foundations building yourself. The first one is a well qualified buyers, in my opinion, have a very strong sense of like budget. Like they understand exactly what their budget looks like. They understand what monthly payment is comfortable for them to continue to live the way they're living, to continue to save money at a high level. And they have really strong, for a lot of us, we didn't have the luxury of having parents teach us this. Some of us, you know, we went and, you know, we did Dave Ramsey courses online, or, or maybe we just found our own gurus to follow. Um, this is one part that I've always struggled with. I didn't, wasn't really like money smart <laughs> growing up. I saw my dad spend money. I never learned about the saving part, right? So that's definitely my, my weakest link out of the four. But you know, for a lot of us, uh, the, what I've seen with well-qualified buyers is their budget is super solid, they're super strong, they're aware exactly what their monthly payment needs to be to, to, to continue, they live the budget they want to, and they continue to save at a high level. Uh, the second pillar that really makes up a well-qualified buyer is, I kind of mentioned it, their savings, okay? Their savings are super solid. They not only have enough savings for the house, they have enough savings for like an emergency. They have even additional like retirement started. They're set, they have done the things needed to kind of start saving or at least have started that at a high level. You know, not these people aren't just buying like, hey, I have, you know, $12,000 and I go, okay, great. What do you have for the house? I told you I have $12,000. Okay, what do you have for your emergency? I told you I have 12,000, like all you have is 12K, no. Let's put 5K of that aside. That's your emergency fund. You only have seven. Now go and start, you know, doing your thing. Let's start saving for a house, right? So these people have a very strong, solid foundation of savings. The third one is going to be credit. Like they have a super strong, healthy relationship with their credit, meaning their credit cards aren't running their life. Like, you know, there's been times of our lives, everyone's maybe done it. The, the statements are high, the balances are high, and we find it feel like we're living like the behest of our credit card lords, not using them as a tool. It's very dangerous. It's like, it's like using a chainsaw. Use a chainsaw the right way, you can cut some really, you know, a big giant trees use it the wrong way you can chop your freaking hand off and you know so the well-qualified buyers have a healthy relationship with their credit where they're being used as a tool to help them their credit that doesn't, it doesn't mean their credit super high it could be someone that just learned how to use their credit in a smart way but these folks have their balances in check they um, don't have too much lines of credit they don't have everything on credit they've learned to ha have some things you know paid off versus have some things not paid off and you know regarding what your relationship is I'm not here to say there's one right way and that's it I'm not a oh you got to have no credit I'm also not like hey you got to have a bunch of credit whatever it is you have a healthy relationship with that and you've started that and the fourth and final one is probably the most key component is there is not only a strong desire like their why of why they're buying is strong but you know that's that's getting into the fluffy territory for my engineers and my people that work in tech they're just like oh, what is this desire what is this why why are you always talking about why no okay if desire and why doesn't float your boat they have a strong sense of urgency you can say where it makes sense to buy rather than to rent right so their desire their why they have a strong component of like this is why we're buying if i put your feet to the fire you're not gonna just like okay never mind i don't want to buy right and that's why i like to poke sometimes especially when i'm having consultations with my first time home buyers like why are you buying like why not just go rent isn't it kind of a dumb idea to buy right now it's just like you know what's i'm not saying that to try to fight with people i'm just like what what's why are we here What's the strong reason why? Now, this could be nice and fluffy. Like for me, um, I grew up and you know, I never had a real home because my parents divorced when I was nine and, and I never wanted a place to go home. I'm having my first child now and I want them to have somewhere where they can grow up and actually feel secure and safe. Or it could just be right now, it's approximately $2,200 to rent a house and uh, it's gonna be about $2,300 to have a mortgage. It makes sense to just buy, it's just why not? Whatever that side what right side or left side of the brain whatever you're using there is something strength of there there's something of substance there so if you have all these four i consider you a well-qualified buyer and those are the folks that should be approaching this yellow territory now i'm gonna be honest a lot of markets are probably more yellow than they are um red maybe it's definitely green there's definitely more yellows out there so really 
the best practice is you're working your best to be this type of buyer, a well-qualified buyer. And you're watching this, you probably say, well, my credit's awesome, Javier, but my savings is lacking or my budget's not really there or, you know, yeah, you know, I have great budget savings and credit, but I don't really like, I'm just so scared to buy whatever it is. Like you, before we even start downloading Zillow and looking at houses, work on these four struck pillars. And that's the best practice I have for you. Actually develop them. And each one of these have their own path that with a lot of great resources out there, just be aware of the weaknesses and start improving them before you go and have a conversation and get into the whirlwind of real estate agents and lenders and all that stuff. So second best practice I have for you. This one's actually a shout out to my, my, my past client and also friend Gabe, the babe. Um, he, we had a very spicy, uh, Benzer negotiation with this beautiful house that they bought. His partner was, was a little, um, you know, frustrated as she should be because, you know, the agent was kind of rude to us. Um, and you know, one of the things he told me, I'll never forget. He was like, you know, I'm trying to tell, tell her that, that what I always saw. I don't remember if he, he made up the corner the spot or he just probably pulled it out of somewhere in his memory bank. He was like, don't let your money get mad. And I was like, what? <laughs> Don't let your emotions get involved in your money decisions. So like in his mind, it still made that house was, was a beautiful house. It, money wise, it made sense. And we weren't going to allow their attitude to affect that. Right. So in honor you gave the babe, I'll give you um, the second one, which is don't get emotional with your money. It's not just about getting mad. It's don't get emotional with your money. Here's what I mean. A lot of us get very emotional when it comes to buying a home and I get it. A home is not just for walls and a window and doors. It's where you make loving memories that last a lifetime. That come on, I've seen I've seen the Hallmark movies, dude. The Christmas movies, Hallmark Christmas movies, the cheesiest ones. <sighs> before hey fellas, before you start judging, go watch a few. And if you're not crying, you know what always gets me is the dad scenes. Like whenever there's this movie that I think it was called The Time Traveler or something where he had the ability to travel back in time and like redo things. You know what I'm talking about? Does anyone know the comment section below, please? If you know, and there was a scene where he goes back and there was going to be a point where he like, he's not gonna be able to see his dad anymore. Oh my God. I had to walk out of the room and go to the, my bed. And you know, have you ever cried so much? You have to put your face in the pillow to cry. Like, ah, oh, dude. I mean, I guess that just shows, uh, a little bit of what my relationship with my dad is right. Um, but anyways, don't get emotional with your home, with the real estate process, with your money. As you prepare for your home purchase and you start maybe wanting to browse online and start like going on Zillow, Realtor, Truly, or whatever website you're using to start kind of looking and just resist that tug of the heart of like, oh, this house has the backyard I've always wanted. Because if you're that type of buyer when you're looking at photos online, a real estate agent is going to have a field day with you if you're just out there falling in love with every house. Listen, at the end of the day, real estate agents are salespeople, right? And if they see a salesperson sees that you're like, oh my God, this is it. They love that. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, this one, last I checked, they have an offer in a table. <gasps> All right. So just, just resist it. Honestly, I wouldn't like, if you're telling your family members, oh, we're buying a house. Oh my gosh, we're buying. Don't say we're buying a house. Instead, say this. Yeah, we did some calculations and I think we're willing to gamble the down payment to purchase a house uh, right now instead of renting because it's about the same monthly payment. We're just tired of, uh, you know, having a landlord and having rules that we have to follow and, and we want to live in something that we own. It's different. I'm buying a house versus, yeah, we, we, we made some decision. We're making some decision to potentially invest because really you're investing your down payment people are always talking about well i'm losing all this money you know buying a house yeah well you're, you're putting your down payment down right to own the house you're hopefully can afford the monthly payment and as long as it's a fixed interest rate you're going to have the same monthly payment so whether the value goes up or down those are just imaginary numbers you're not really going to know what your house is worth until you put your house in the market really that's well, the only thing you're really investing other than you know remodeling i guess and repairs and all that but hopefully that part isn't like a necessity that's like the fun part of home ownership but anyway it needs to be that it needs to not 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 be too emotional too much fluff um, it needs to be more logical, more straightforward. Like this is what we want. And when you're building out your, your criteria of what you're looking for a house, you need to have that same kind of energy. I'm looking for three bedrooms, two bath, 
uh, potentially an extra den for an office so we can work from home. I need a pool because I don't want to invest in one later. We need this kind of neighborhood of this school district, etc. If I could just have a list of like must haves, you're looking at it like a checkbox system, right? So, and we'll go over that in the second video more because I think it's it's easier to have a checkbox to check mark and then assign a rating to each part of the house. That way you can kind of logically see what's the rating of that house is and see if you actually should make an offer on it or not, right? Really getting technical with this. And now if you're not a numbers brain, I'm not a numbers guy either, okay? Trust me. You gave me a bunch of numbers, I, I'm going to probably cry and, and then bring up the time traveler freaking movie and start crying about my dad again. Um, so <laughs> try to not get too emotional about the buying process as you're expecting it because you're going to you're going to set yourself up to basically be put in a position where you're not going to win, you're not going to succeed, you're not going to have a good experience, right? Last but not least, as the best practices I have for people. Now, this one's going to bite me in the butt, but I appreciate when people do it. You need to make sure to interview multiple people when you're hiring to build your team out. I'm not saying, oh, you know, finding your agent or no, finding your lender. No, you're you're building your team to help you buy a home. Especially now with the new commission thing, like the odds most of the time sellers are going to pay for the compensation, but still you, you want to, you know, you might be in a, put in a position where you have to pay a little bit of it, right? So if you're going to have to potentially pay, you want to make sure you at least are hiring the best. So yeah, I say this is going to bite me in the butt because there's this one situation. I, I usually win when people, you know, like interview most agents. But there's one situation like two months ago where they decided not to hire me. And I was like, oh, can I have some feedback? Why you didn't hire me? It's not like a kid now, bruh, saying bruh, bruh. They sent me like a like a long paragraph of like <laughs> everything I did wrong. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, anyways, it's about you, though. It's like if, if this is about you, not about the agents, not the prima donna, it's not about the lenders, right? So here's the step process I have for you when you're interviewing um, your agent and your lender, because there's really two. So you want to at least interview three agents and you kind of just want to see what their procedure and their process looks like. Like don't have an expectation. Just send that email, send that text. Hey, I want to potentially meet. Maybe they're at a point in their life where they're so busy and you'll get your message not replied for like two weeks. And it's like, oh, maybe it's not the best agent. Uh, maybe they're going to be right on it. And you're going to maybe be led through a consultation and, you know, allow yourself to be wine and dine for a bit. See what the process looks like. See what they, you know, what they look and you know, how that system for that they want to do is and see what their consultation and their buyer, you know, consultation or meeting goes like and just kind of see how it goes. Um, what you want to find out is what's their minimum compensation, of course, and you want to see a track record of how like that's been working. So, for example, if they're saying, yes, the seller's going to pay the compensation, ask, can I see some examples of that? Can you show me some contracts? Pull out your email right now. Let's see it. Three, literally organization. How organized are they? Have them pull out their email, your phone. Let me see how much emails you have on open round. Let me see how many text messages you have on open right now. Let's see what's up. Let's see if, if they're organized. Let's see if they have their stuff together because you could be working with someone who's a top dog, but if they're like five, 10 escrows in the pipeline right now and they're not really organized, it's going to hurt. So are they organized? And last but not least, what is their experience? experience like because at the end of the day you're hiring someone based on their experience how many houses have they sold if they don't have their information public have them print you out a list of all the houses they've sold in the last six months to a year like yes it's going to require some work and once again this is going to bite me in the butt because some of you guys are going to be emailing and texting me all these things i will be ready <laughs> so like really figure out if these folks are the right people for you. So a interview them, interview at least three agents, um, let them wine and dine you, go through their process, see if that, uh, you know, works. And maybe you're going to get a good idea if they're in the right part of their life, if they're, you know, they're the right season to help you. Cause maybe they're usually an amazing agent, but they're just going through a, like a low time right now. And quite frankly, you don't want to have that in your team, uh, compensation. How's that work? How much are they going to charge you and who pays that? Are they organized and what's their experience and if they can provide data for that experience? That's for the agent. For the lender, same thing. You want to at least talk to three lenders. Now, don't get your credit pooled until you're at least like pretty close to start looking. Because if you're like looking a year from now, it's probably not a good idea to, to shop lenders right now. A lot of people are under the assumption that we're, we're talking to these lenders and we're asking for their interest rate. 
and see who has the best interest rate. That is not the best uh, philosophy in my opinion. Here's why. Interest rates are fluctuating every day. Every single day they go up and down. Literally by the hour, they go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So if you're like, are doing your pre-qualification here and they're gonna, you know, maybe, and then you talk to another agent or sorry, another lender like a few days later, and then they're gonna give you a quote here, this lender's gonna seem much better, right? So no, we're not looking for the interest rate. Where we're shopping around is a few factors, which we're going to go over now. One, what are their actual closing costs? Well, actually, before we get to two, let them wine and dine you too. Like, what's their experience? What's a client experience look like? I had a client of mine who who uh, I love them to death. Um, uh, Stan and I'll call them Stan and Lore. Funny enough, they actually didn't find me on YouTube. Um, I'm part of a team and uh, we have a Zillow kind of agreement where we meet. So they met me completely blind and they were working together. She reads everything on the contract <laughs> and she was like shopped around because I recommended three or four lenders. And the one that ended up winning their business was based not necessarily off their fees, but their client experience with how they presented the fees. They had like a really nicely designed break closing cost breakdown. And it was really easy to read. Whereas most other lenders are selling like these massive four or five pages of different fees. And it was like, which, what, what am I looking at? Right? Like let them wine and dine you. What's the client experience look like? The second thing, let's get back to it. What are the closing costs look like? And they're, and they're going to say, well, we can't estimate title fees and no, we're not, we don't care about that. What are you charging me? You, what are you charging me? That's what I want to know. Third thing is what are you doing to keep a tabs on the interest rate? One of the, my favorite lenders that I work with right now, Courtney, I put row eight, right interest, right. Um, making this video at 9 PM and that's for dad time. That's pretty late. Uh, interest rate uh, is she gets like this text that let her know and she like always puts on her social media like you know oh look at the, we need to lock in the rate today because there's this is going on with the bond market yada 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 like what are you using to keep track of the rate because I know that the rate is gonna fluctuate through my escrow process I'm gonna trust you to tell me when to lock it in so I get the best rate possible what are you gonna do and do you have a flow policy and how does it work a lot of lenders float, meaning like if the rate drops more while you're under contract, are you able to bring it down? Everyone says they do a float policy, but then they always fight you when they're, when it actually does float down. So like get really specific details. How many points does it need to drop? Can I be the one that looking at the rates or are you looking at the rates? Where do I look at? You know, how does the process work? Last but not least is you're shopping out vibes. Are they picking up their phone when you call on the weekend? Are they like cool to talk to are they actually are they the type of lender that just throws away these big words to make you make themselves feel smarter or are they very good at like explaining things very simply what you do is you tell them great you know um I, we really want to work with you what's going to happen is we're looking at houses now so please send me your pre-qualification send me the loan estimate and what we're going to do is once we are under contract once we have an offer accepted i'm going to send you the contract and within two to three business days i'm going to make a last call like a final decision on who i want to hire so, so i'm going to give you the opportunity again to give me your best rate, give me your best fees. And since we're under contract, you hopefully will be able to give me an idea of your rate at that point. And then I can make my decision. Make sure it's two to three days. Don't, don't be trying to switch lenders a week after close of escrow. And then that way you get them, give them the shot to fight over it again. So really do a good job building out your team folks, because odds are you're probably gonna have to sign agreements with whoever you decide to work with. So do your due diligence. If they take it personal that you're asking these questions and like, okay, well, you do work for me as you tell them that you tell them that you're working for me. So like you're making good money, two to 3%, like it's good money, whether I'm paying for it or the seller's paying for it. I expect some high, some quality or level of service here, but all right. Now here's something I have for you. Okay. If you watch this and you've already bought, you come back to watch this again, or maybe you just have something to add, please leave it in the comments below. Like I've gotten some really valuable stuff when I'm like, geeking out or learning about something new, not just by the videos, but like the comments people leave down below. So our people that watch these videos, I have, we have a wonderful community here that people leave a lot of feedback and a lot of like good stuff on the comments. Please go check it out. We also have a private discord community. If you want to just engage and talk with other home buyers, it's a little dead right now because I haven't been around for the last month, but we're going to get that going again. So links in the description. If you want to support the channel, we have a few ways of doing that. Uh, I have a gum road with a bunch of home buyer resources just for $5. You can get access to them. Just like little simple tools for you to use. We also have a great agent referral program. If you want an agent anywhere in the country, 
go ahead and click here, click on information, start filling this stuff out, and then you'll get connected with a wonderful agent. If you are looking in Phoenix, Arizona area though, uh, holler at your guy. All my information is in the description below. So thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate you. I hope you guys uh, go watch a good, sad Hallmark movie and just let out a good cry because we all deserve it. Thank you guys.